is my distinct pleasure to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Tushar Chandra, who's going to be uh, talking to us today about Sybil, which is a new project he's involved in at Google. Uh, Tushar received the PhD in computer science from Cornell in 1993. Um, after receiving the PhD, worked for a number of years at IBM Research before joining Google in 2004, where he's currently principal engineer. Um, Tushar's work is extremely well known to the defendability community, and I'm sure uh, most of you are, are well aware of that. He's one of those rare individuals whose research has had a profound impact on both the theory and the practice of dependable systems. Um, you hear the word seminal used often to describe people's research, perhaps overused, but in this case, there's absolutely no doubt that the Chandra and Tueg paper Unreliable Failure Detectors for Reliable Distributed Systems, which appeared in JACM in March 1996 and also was partially based on an earlier POTSI paper, um, deserves the, the term, truly deserves to be called seminal. According to Google Scholar, this single paper has been referenced more than 2,600 times. Um, and this work launched a completely new research area looking at the capabilities of imperfect failure detectors. Uh, an area that remains active today, almost 20 years later, and which has had a profound impact on the theory of dependable distributed systems. Um, as I mentioned, his work has also had a substantial impact on practice. Um, in POTSI 2007, he published Paxos Made Live, an engineering perspective, which reported um, use of the well-known Paxos consensus protocol to maintain replicated state for Google's, Google's uh, chubby excuse me, Google's Chubby Lock Service. And as most of you probably know, Chubby is at the heart of both Google File System and, and Bigtable. And Tushar also was involved in the development of Bigtable itself, which is no doubt the most widely used distributed storage service for big data applications in the cloud. Um, and these are really just a few examples of the many practical systems that he's contributed to, which have impacted computer scientists, application developers, and end users in, in many ways. Um, Tushar has received numerous awards. One of those uh, in particular is probably worth mentioning, the 2010 Dijkstra Prize in Distributed Computing. Um, I could go on and on, but I, I want to leave a, a few minutes for, for Tushar's talk, so I think I'll stop there and um, Without further ado, I present to you Thank you for those very kind words of introduction. Um, so yes, I will be talking about Sybil, a system for large-scale machine learning that uh, we built at Google Research. We've been working on Sybil for several years now and uh, have had a number of successes, but the field of machine learning is also rapidly evolving. So this is a project that is under very active development right now. And in fact, we've increased our investment and have ramped up the team pretty substantially, doubling its size perhaps in the last seven or eight uh, months. So um, before I talk about machine learning, I want to spend a few minutes reflecting on uh, computing infrastructure. So when an application developer develops an application, they expect to have something that's available to them in the infrastructure layer. Many years ago, that infrastructure was probably just electricity. But then over time, we started standardizing our expectations for computing hardware. And today you have multiple platforms, but you expect a CPU, RAM, hard disk um, as part of that hardware. And then soon afterwards, we started standardizing our expectation on operating systems. And again, we have multiple operating systems out there, but they all do the same kinds of things. And then over time, Databases and networks also became part of this computing infrastructure. Today, when I build it, um, uh, an application, I also expect certain distributed computing primitives to be part of that infrastructure. I expect to have a cluster file system, like uh, the Google file system. I expect to have computing primitives like MapReduce and Bigtable. And I would use those as uh, you know, the foundation on which I build my application. Now. This picture is by no means complete. There are probably a few things that are missing out there. The key observation is that this continues to evolve. So if there's one message that I want to leave you with, it is that I believe that very soon, machine learning will also become part of this infrastructure. 
the applications are widespread enough, the impact is broad enough that um, an application developer will expect to have access to a machine learning platform. And in fact, at Google today, many of our application developers do have access to uh, a machine learning platform as part of the computing infrastructure. And so this offers an opportunity for all of us. Uh, the field is rapidly evolving. It's relatively easy to get in. Um, and so there's an opportunity for some of us to start working on machine learning. For the rest of us who are working on other parts of the infrastructure, consider this. Um, like every new layer, machine learning will impose new constraints on and new requirements on other layers in the compute infrastructure. And so you have an opportunity to be a pioneer there and uh, evolve your layer in a direction that's friendly towards this new piece of infrastructure that will be available. Okay, so with those um, very high-level views, let me get into machine learning itself. And um, I want to start with an example from YouTube. So this here is a screenshot of uh, a page from YouTube. Many of you have probably seen stuff like this. And in this case, the viewer is watching a video about Thomas the Tank Engine. So um, for those of you who have kids, you'll know what I'm talking about. I have a five-year-old, and until recently, this was the kind of thing he would watch on YouTube. Now, he's just learning how to read and write, so um, when he would watch Thomas the Tank Engine, he couldn't use the search box to decide what to watch next. Instead, he would use these recommended videos on the right-hand side to help him decide what to do next. And it shouldn't be a surprise to you that a lot of our users actually use these recommendations to decide what to do next. So um, recommended videos is a very important part of, uh, of the YouTube product. And so we decided to use machine learning to try to improve the quality of these recommendations. And here's what we did. We um, looked at historical data of how users have interacted with our website. And we use that to build a model that predicts how users will react in the future. So uh, here's an example of the kind of thing that we did. Our model will now predict that, um, will predict the probability that a user will click on a particular video recommendation. In this example, the model is predicting that there's a 9% chance that the user will click on the first recommendation. There's an 8% chance that they click on the second recommendation. There's a 6% chance they'll click on the third recommendation and so on. And so, if you have an accurate model, you can use it to make recommendations. And here's what you do. You get a whole bunch of candidate videos, and you feed them into the model. And you ask the model, predict what's going to happen if I show these videos. So the model makes these predictions, and then you take the top ranking videos, the videos with the highest click probabilities, and those are the ones that you show. And that's how we use machine learning to improve the quality of these uh, video recommendations. Now, I'm going to use this as a running example through my talk, but there are many other examples. This is just one of them. So this here is a graphic that shows you what happened when we launched this machine learning model. On the x-axis, we have time. And um, time is measured in days or weeks or months or something reasonable. On the y-axis, we have the number of video watches. Now, the blue squiggly line shows you watches coming from the recommended videos product. And the red line is a baseline. It shows you watches coming from some other sources. So the way to study the impact of this, um, of this uh, model that we launched is to compare these two squiggly lines. And as you can see, when we launched the model, there was a pretty dramatic improvement in the number of watches across all of YouTube. Um, and in fact, if you'll notice, the, the red line actually showed, saw a downtick. And that is probably because users were moving away from those sources and moving towards recommended videos. So what I showed you was hardly YouTube specific. And it's not a big leap of imagination to imagine that you could use this kind of technology in other settings as well. Um, we've seen it used in multiple different places. You could use it in search, you could use it in YouTube. You could use it in the Android App Store to recommend applications. You could use it in ads to recommend the right ads to show to our users. And in fact, you could use it in most large applications that, are, that, you, that Google makes available to our users. Um, I also showed you how to use machine learning to improve 
um, recommendations, to produce highly relevant recommendations. But in fact, it can be used in other settings as well. We use it in monetization to um, you know, improve the quality of our ads. We can use it to detect spam, to you know, identify bad content that's uh, showing up on email and other sources. And in fact, we can use it in many, many other settings as well, and, and we have done so. So um, I have personally seen this kind of capability used in many, many products in many, many different settings. And so I no longer view this as an interesting experimental idea. This is now an industry best practice. If anyone is building a high quality large um, website, there's a very good chance that they're eventually going to put one or more machine learning solutions in place. And I should point out that on many properties, you actually have multiple machine learning solutions working together to improve the quality of the product. The second thing, which is kind of one of the things we struggle with, is that as the property grows, the accuracy of our predictions becomes more and more important. So on the one hand, we want to make more accurate predictions. On the other hand, we have this deluge of data that we have to deal with. And so we attempted to hack, we attempted to put approximate solutions in place, um, but in fact the product is driving us in the exact opposite direction. So one way of viewing it is that um, on a large property, a 1% improvement is a very big deal. When you have millions and millions of users like we do on YouTube, a 1% improvement is 1% multiplied by millions and millions and millions, and that's a pretty big deal. Another way of viewing it is that uh, if you have an ads property, a 1% improvement could immediately translate into millions of dollars of revenue, which again is a very big deal. So um, we put in a lot of effort to produce you know, accurate machine learning solutions that can work at scale. So what do I mean by large scale? Um, a large property could have hundreds of billions of training examples. What do I mean by a training example? It's a single user experience. In the case of YouTube, with my running example, perhaps it is that one web page that my son saw six months ago, along with all the recommendations that we showed, showed him. We also record the outcome to know whether the recommendations we made were good or whether they were bad. So that's a single training example. Now you can see that on a large property you can easily get to hundreds of billions of these, and that's what we do. We also handle hundreds of billions of features. So what do I mean by a feature? In the context of a property like YouTube, perhaps it is the ID of the video that we showed. And as you can imagine, we have lots and lots and lots of videos to show our users. So that space is a gigantic space. Perhaps it is the ID of the recommendation that we showed the user. And that again is basically the same space. But in fact, sometimes we do things that are even more complicated. So um, we might end up taking the pair, the video that we showed and the recommendation that we showed. And so if you thought the video space was large, the spare space is really, really, really large. And we very quickly get to hundreds of billions when you do things like this. Um, and there are many, many other things that we do also that are, you know, very large scale. A typical example will have, you know, 100 plus features in it. And um, as you can imagine, this is a system that keeps running. So there's data coming to us constantly. Um, while we sleep, while we are awake, while we are writing code, there's data coming into the system. So this is a one slide overview, perhaps for the rest of the talk, and um, it shows you the results that we've achieved. We have built a principled, large-scale supervised machine learning system, platform, sorry. Um, so what do I mean by principled? Well, we're using theoretically sound algorithms, algorithms that have occurred in the literature for many, many years that have been studied in great depth. Um, those are the algorithms that we wanted to work with. We've demonstrated that we can solve internet scale problems. I mean, YouTube is clearly one of them. These are some of the largest problems that exist out there. We also demonstrated that we can do this using reasonable resources. And what I mean by that is, my users don't really complain about the number of resources that they have to use. And in fact, if I asked them to double the amount of resources they were using, they'd probably be fine with that too. So we're using a reasonable number of resources. And as I mentioned before, um, we've used these kind of systems on multiple properties to solve multiple different kinds of problems. So this strongly suggests that there is value in having a large-scale machine learning platform rather than having one-off solutions for every problem that we encounter. 
Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about the system. But before that, let me reflect for a moment between the differences between academia and industry. So, in academia, sometimes we like complex solutions because that's how we're going to advance science. In industry, we are often driven by the exact opposite pressures. We have time to market constraints. I have a user, user base that has to understand what I'm doing. So having simplicity is really, really, really important. And finally, I'm trying to grow my team, I'm trying to hire people. And I don't want to be restricted to people who have double PhDs in um, distributed computing and machine learning because there's probably nobody there. So we really wanted to build a super, super simple system. As I go through this talk, many of you will hopefully wonder that this is really a simple system. It's a simple design. And I want to point out that we worked very hard to get there so that we could um, you know, meet some of these requirements. So we use MapReduce for scalability. Um, we use multiple cores and multiple threads per computer for uh, efficiency. We have large amounts of data, as I've indicated. So we use the Google file system to store all this data. And we've adopted a number of ideas from elsewhere in computer science and adapted them to machine learning. So for example, we use a columnar store with uh, frequency-based dictionary compression. Now, I have seen multiple designs for large-scale machine learning. I've even seen multiple other systems for large-scale machine learning. To the best of my knowledge, Sybil is the only system that did not build its own distributed system. Every other system has a custom distributed system built inside it. And again, this was done by design. We really did not want to build a distributed system. We wanted to build a machine learning system. Of course, we use MapReduce and GFS to give us what we need from distributed computing. Okay, so this is a picture of a typical machine learning deployment. So you, the user, are that blue rectangle right at the top, and you interact with one of our servers. Now. When we show you something, we record the fact that we showed that something. So for example, when my son watched that video six months ago perhaps, we probably recorded somewhere saying, we showed this video and these are the recommendations that we suggested to the user. And then a little later, maybe the user will say, hmm, I like one of these recommendations. They'll click on that recommendation and they'll start watching that video. When that happens, we log that event as well in our interaction logs. So as you can see, a single event can actually be scattered, can be separated by, um, can consist of multiple events that occur at different instances of time. And so we typically run a log joining process, which combines all these events to create a single training example. These training examples are fed into the machine learning system. The machine learning system creates models that it ships back out into the serving system. And if you've done a good job, hopefully your experience will improve every time we do this. Now, even here, we picked up an idea from the database com uh, community and applied it um, inside the, in machine learning. Um, we noticed that a lot of our users wanted to keep lots of information about the documents that they show. So, for example, they want to keep the video ID, but perhaps they want to record the publisher of the video as well. So, for example, if you recommend a video by a professional publisher like Sony or FIFA or someone like that, our users are much more likely to want to watch that video than if it was a video published by me, which is going to be shaky and awful quality and perhaps irrelevant to everybody else. So we want to record all this information so that uh, the machine learning model has an opportunity to learn that certain video publishers are better than others. Now, if you were to record all this information, our impression logs could become very, very large, and that becomes pretty expensive. So instead, what we did is we normalized our logs. And in many cases, we just record the ID of the document that we're showing in our logs. And then we join it to the database later on, where we denormalize um, our logs. Right? So very simple idea from databases, but it was particularly relevant here. Now, these systems are typically operated by software engineers or data analysts. And uh, these are people who are looking at these systems, looking for bugs, looking for problems. But they're also looking at these systems, looking for new signals. When they find a new signal, they can put it into the machine learning system, and they'll get a better product. And uh, you guys will get better um, and more relevant results. So it's very important to have analysis tools that can run over these data sets and help our software engineers and data analysts. Now again, these are multi-terabyte data sets. 
So these analysis tools have to work at scale. And it's not okay for an analysis tool to take hours to produce a result for a user. We want these results quickly, hopefully in seconds. So this here is another view of the same architecture that I just showed you. And here what I've tried to do is break up the components and show you what runs in which data center. So we typically run the training system in a single data center because that's the simplest thing to do. Unfortunately, we can't do the same thing with the serving system because we have users scattered across the globe and different users end up talking to different data centers when uh, uh, they come to our properties. So for example, if you're a North American user, perhaps you will talk to a North American data center. If you're a European user, you'll talk to a European data center. And if you're an Asian user, perhaps you'll talk to an Asian data center and so on. So we need to make this work. We need to collect log records from all these data centers, feed it into the uh, training data center, and then when we have a new model, ship it out to all these data centers. Again, this should be pretty obvious, but uh, probably something you wouldn't think about until somebody pointed it out to you. Okay, so with that high-level overview of how we do machine learning, I want to get into the algorithms themselves, themselves and talk about the system's implications. So, um, as I mentioned, we use algorithms that have been well proven in the literature. In particular, we use algorithms based on parallel boosting. As you can see here, parallel boosting has been around for over a decade and was pioneered by Colin Shapiro and Singer um, starting in about 2001. Um, and parallel boosting is particularly well suited for some of our requirements. Now, good for us, Yoram Singer is one of the founders of this project, so it is particularly easy for us to do this. Okay, so um, here's a simple idea of what parallel boosting does. We start with an approximate solution, an approximate model, and that model could be really bad. It could be the null model with all zeros in it, for example. And then we feed the model and all the training data into um, this iterative learner. At the end of the iteration, the algorithm is guaranteed to produce a better model. So if you keep iterating, the model gets better and better and better. And as you can see in my second bullet, the convergence rate of these algorithms is pretty reasonable. So this works pretty well for us. Now one of the nice consequences of this is that if we have a numerical error, we can deal with it. A numerical error is just an approximate solution. It's a, it's a bad approximate solution. But if you feed a model with a numerical error back into the system, the system will start fixing that numerical error, error algorithmically. So this, of course, has implications for people working lower on the stack than us. If our algorithms can deal with a certain class of errors, uh, we have a lesser need from lower level infrastructure to help us because uh, we can recover from it too. Now I have a couple of red bullets in here. This is for any machine learning people out here. I won't talk about them, but keep going. One of the most important things about parallel boosting is that it's very well suited for uh, MapReduce plus GFS. And this is what allowed us not to build a distributed system. Of course, we had to add a number of optimizations, and I will talk about some of them in this presentation. <clears throat> so I want to spend one slide giving you a sense of how parallel boosting actually works. I don't expect anyone to fully understand what I'm talking about. I just want you to get a sense of the flow of information, because that's what's going to govern how we actually build the system. Um, this particular version of parallel boosting that I'm showing you is a super simplified version. What we have in practice is a more complicated version where the equations are similar in nature except they're much longer. And that's not going to help anyone here um, because it doesn't actually add any depth to how we do the distributed systems part of it. So with those, that caveat and maybe a couple of others that I didn't even mention, uh, let me get started. So you should view parallel boosting as computation on a bipartite graph. On the left hand side we have the examples of the instances and remember there could be hundreds of billions of these. On the right hand side we have features and there could be hundreds of billions of those as well. So that video watch that my son did maybe six months ago that's one of the dots on the left hand side and the video ID of that Thomas the Tank Engine video is one of the dots on the right hand side. There is an edge between an instance and, in, and a feature if that feature occurred in that instance. 
So with this setup, here's how the algorithm works. <clears throat> in the first phase, each instance does the simple computation I've shown you on the left-hand side. Instance i computes q of i, which is this 1 upon 1 plus x, blah, 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 in it. And um, the w in there is the old approximate model. That's, what, that's how the old approximate model gets used in this computation. Now, when an instance does that computation, it sends the value of qi along all the edges that connect to it. So it sends it to all the features that occur in that instance. Now, in the second phase of this computation, the features do something. What they do is they accumulate all the QIs that they get from incoming edges. They compute a statistic called mu plus, and these are all from the parallel boosting papers. And mu plus is basically the sum of all the QIs coming from the good examples, from the examples where the user liked her recommendation. The mu minuses, as you can guess, are the sum of the QIs coming from the bad examples, where we made a recommendation but the user ignored us. And then um, the weight update step, where you get a slightly, you get an improved model, is, um, is the final step down there, where we add meta log mu plus upon mu minus. And with this computation, we get a better model, and there are proofs about how all this works. So I want to make a couple of observations. Notice that this is a massively parallel computation. If I had 100 billion cores, I could do those instance computations completely in parallel. If I had 100 billion cores, I could do the feature computations in parallel as well. Of course, there's that shuffle phase that is a little bit more complicated. Now, for those of you who are familiar with MapReduce, you will see that this is a classic MapReduce. This is exactly what MapReduce does. And so, let's talk about that. Now, for the few people who may not know about MapReduce, I'm going to spend a few seconds describing it. It's a parallel pr um, mo uh, programming model for processing very, very large data sets. The original MapReduce paper came out more than 10 years ago, uh, and it was developed at Google. It's a proven model of computation. Over the last decade, I've seen numerous uses of MapReduce, and it's always proven itself. We have a pretty robust implementation at Google. It's been around 10 years, and um, we've been improving it constantly. There's an open source version in Hadoop as well, which has also been around for a while. So this is a very proven programming model. Perhaps one of the most interesting things about MapReduce is that most Google engineers have actually written a MapReduce. And so this is simple enough that you don't need a PhD in uh, distributed systems to use it. You can be you know, an undergraduate and you can actually do some useful stuff with MapReduce. So anyway, this is how we use MapReduce to solve, um, to implement parallel boosting. We take the instances that I showed you in the previous slide, we feed them into the mappers of the MapReduce. And then each feature is assigned to one of the reducers. And so the computation is very simple. You take the, you take the instance, compute Q of I in the mapper, and then you send that Q of I to the reducers corresponding to the features in, those, in that example. In fact, this um, slide here is, is a ditto copy of the previous slide, except we have mappers and reducers in between the instances and the features. And that's exactly what we do. Okay, so with that um, brief presentation on how we do parallel boosting, I want to talk about some of the design principles that we adopted in Sybil. And the first design principle I want to talk about is our use of the file system for communication. So as you can see, we have multiple binaries in Sybil. This is a super simplified version of an actual Sybil pipeline. In fact, we have a lot more binaries. In fact, there are some inaccuracies here, but it doesn't change the, the basic intent. I've shown you five binaries here. The first, uh, the binaries are the um, green boxes on top. The first three binaries are used to set up the training data. They're the log joiner, they set up data in our own formats and so on. And so typically you have one copy of those binaries in a Sybil pipeline. Now, when people set up a civil pipeline, they typically have a number of features that they really care about, but they typically throw in a number of experimental features as well. These are things that might work or they might not work. And so they end up having a large number of features uh, in every training example. Now, when they actually run learners, they don't run them over all the features. They try different subsets of features, trying to identify which ones have a signal and which ones don't. Um, 
They also try different forms of regularization. For those of you familiar with machine learning, they try different loss functions. The upshot of this is that a typical civil pipeline will have multiple learners running in it, multiple copies of that binary. And similarly, they have multiple model exporters because multiple of these models may actually be running in a production setting. So um, each of these tasks typically produces some data, uh, its own data set. And so in this particular case, we have five data sets as well. Notice that the communication between binaries and um, files is reasonably complex. It's not a simple pipeline, but it is a directed acyclic graph. Also notice that typically each binary produces one output. Right? So, in some sense, the binaries are communicating with each other through files in the file system. So, um, when we were designing the system, up front we realized that um, we are going to continuously get new training data. And so we had to handle that. And the mechanism we used is we decided to use a simple form of versioning on top of GFS. So, when new training data is available, the log joiner basically creates a new version of the training data, and the job downstream from it in the pipeline uses that new version as its new input. Now, when it processes that new version, it produces new output as well. So it ends up creating a new version of its output as well. And basically, the new input uh, causes a ripple effect of new data across the entire pipeline. So we decided to address this by versioning the entire system. All the files in Sybil are versioned, and the idea is that every job looks for the latest version of input data, and when it's done, it produces a new latest version of output data as well. And this very simple mechanism helps us deal with new data and, in fact, changing data. Sometimes old training data changes under us, and we can handle that as well. Now notice that we are using the file system as a publish and subscribe system. So file existence is very important. When we notice a new version, our jobs can wake up and say, oh, I need to do something. Um, and in fact, file names drive some of our computations. <clears throat> also notice that because jobs don't talk to each other directly, there are all kinds of distributed computing failures that we don't have to worry about. All we rely on is a persistent file system, and we're pretty much done with that very simple idea. Of course, we have to make sure that our jobs are right important. A job can fail at any time. And we've made sure that when the job restarts, it ends up doing what it would have done the first time around, um, including all the updates to the file system. They look exactly like they would have if the job had run earlier. <clears throat> now, when you use a file system as a publish and subscribe system, um, we have to wonder about what to do about metadata. And we had two choices. We could either put the metadata in the file system itself, or we could encode the metadata in the name of the file itself. In most cases, we elected to do the latter. And as a result, our file names can get pretty long. We have seen file names that are well over a kilobyte in length. And we've had some interesting discussions with the GFS team when uh, we violated some of their assumptions in terms of lengths of file names. We routinely use file names for debugging purposes. So if a pipeline is down for whatever reason, using simple tools like LS, we can look at the file system and conclude that the first three jobs in the pipeline are running fine, but job number four seemed to have stalled maybe four days ago, and then we can go in with that knowledge and debug the system. So it is very important for us to make human-readable file names. And so that last um, thing in red is an example of a file name from one of our code labs. And just looking at it, you can infer a number of things. You can infer that this is a file about a model, that it's running an experiment named model1 underscore 2x underscore crosses. Remember how I said that parallel boosting is iterative? So you can see that this is the output of the 183rd, 1073rd iteration of parallel boosting. And in fact, looking at the file name, you can also conclude that, conclude that um, this file was created at, um, on January 23rd, 2014 at 4 a.m. daylight saving time. I think Pacific saving time, uh, Pacific daylight saving time. <clears throat> when we started Sybil, we used the natural order for storing our training data. We used a row-oriented format. And what I mean by a row-oriented format is 
The first record in the first file is the first training example that we saw. The second record in the first file is the second training example that we saw, and so on. Now, when we have a very large data set, of course, we can't put it into one file. So we shard it across multiple files. And the first file has the first n training examples. The next file has the next m training examples, and so on. But as we worked on Sybil, we realized that, in fact, a row-oriented format was not the right format, but that a column-oriented format is even better for machine learning. What do I mean by a column-oriented format? I mean that a file is now responsible for a particular field, not a particular set of records. <clears throat> so in fact, the first training record now is scattered across three files. Its first field is the first record of file one. Its second field is the first record of file two. And its third field is the first record of file three. <clears throat> so why did we do this? Well, as I mentioned earlier today, um, when our users set up their pipelines, they have lots of features in their pipelines. Some of the features are really important, and some of them are experimental. Now, when they run their learners, they don't run them on all the features. If you had a row-oriented format, you would have to read the entire training record, which would consume IO bandwidth. You'd have to uncompress it, because all this data is, of course, going to be compressed. And then you'd end up throwing most of it away. And that's not a really nice thing to do. However, if you have a column-oriented format, you end up reading just the data that you care about, and you end up processing just that data. So that turned out to be pretty helpful to help us work at scale. We also noticed that our users were doing lots of transformations. So a user may have you know, a score in their data, and they may want to use the log of that score or the exp of that score in training. Or they may have two or three you know, values in the data, and they may want to train on the sum of those values. So they do these kinds of transformations over the data all the time. It turns out that it's more efficient to do these kinds of transformations in a column-oriented format rather than a row-oriented format. And one way about thinking, of thinking about it is, if you have a row-oriented format and you want to do a transformation, you essentially have to scan through the row, trying to find the right field, and then run the transformation over it. In a column-oriented format, you don't have to do any scans, because you're running the transformation over the column. <clears throat> and finally, a column-oriented format compresses better. The data are more self-similar, and so compression algorithms do a better job on it. So this was another really important um, design decision that helped us run at scale. <clears throat> okay, so the next design decision that we took was that we decided to use a dictionary of features. Now, the raw training data has pretty long strings as features. A string could be, you know, 10 bytes long, it could even be 100 bytes long. That would take a lot of space. So what we did instead is we went over the, the data column at a time. We identified how many unique features there are. And then we assigned a unique integer to each feature. So if a column has n features, we assign integers from 0 to n minus 1 to the features in that column. Um, further, we encoded these features in decreasing order of frequency. So feature number 0 in a column is the most common feature in the column. Feature number 1 is the second most common, and so on. And then finally, we used a variable length encoding scheme for these integers. And this ensured that our most frequent feature had the shortest um, encoding. So this will remind some of you of Huffman codes. And in fact, yes, this is the same kind of idea there. So this approach had two advantages for us. One advantage is pretty obvious. It helped us get you know, pretty dramatic data compression. And I'll show you these numbers later on in this presentation. The second advantage is a little less obvious, so I want to spend a few minutes talking about it. You see, we um, store information about all the features in memory in all our machines. Now, if we didn't encode the features, we would end up storing this in a hash table. And we typically need a few bytes per feature, let's say eight bytes per feature. If you encode this in a hash table, you're going to have the overhead of the key. You're going to have the overhead of uh, the wasted space on the hash table. You're going to have perhaps a pointer or two. So you end up taking a lot of space, a lot of extra space. If you, encode, if you use this dense integer encoding, you can use a vector instead, where the ith entry in the vector is the data structure for the ith feature. So this results in a more compact data structure that's used memory more efficiently. And in fact, it's much faster. You don't have to hash anything. You can just jump straight to the feature and get its value. <clears throat> so this leads me to the next design principle, and that is that we decided to store a lot of stuff in RAM. We decided to store the previous model in RAM, and remember we have billions of features here, 
So this is a pretty large data structure. Um, and we also decided to store the learning statistics um, in RAM. In the case of boosting, this works out to about 10 bytes a feature. There are some optimizations that let you get a little bit less, but it's about order of 10 bytes a feature. And remember, we're dealing with billions of features here, so we're talking about tens of gigabytes of RAM on every worker in a MapReduce. <coughs> so, um, when we made this design decision, a number of engineers looking at this design were pretty skeptical about what we were doing. Back then, a machine had maybe 8 to 16 gigabytes of RAM on it. And um, when you make these kinds of decisions, the very largest models just barely fit into memory. So people were worried that maybe Sybil wouldn't work. But Moore's law helped us here. We, we expected it would, which is why we made this decision. And today, very few, very few people worry about um, the fact that we have in-memory models. Now, the upside of using in-memory models is that it dramatically speeded up our design. The alternative would have been to keep our models in a distributed hash table, perhaps. And so when you were computing QI, you would have to do an RPC to another machine get the value, and then use it. With this approach, it's just a local memory lookup. And in fact, in one of, our, one of the benchmarks that I ran many years ago, this approach is about 30 times faster end-to-end -end than um, the RPC-based approach. So it really worked for us. This leads me to our next design decision. Um, we decided to optimize for multi-core. Now, when we started Sybil, our machines were pretty small. Multi-core had just sort of started to happen. Um, and machines in our data centers had maybe four or eight cores in them. But we saw the trend. We saw that we were going to have a lot more cores down the line. So we decided to do something with it. And in particular, we were worried about our memory consumption. So we said, if we can share our large data structures across cores, then in fact it can all work out. So sharing the model is particularly easy because the model is a constant for the entire duration of um, an iteration. And so it's a read-only data structure. It's easy to share. It turned out that sharing the statistics was much harder. And um, we had to do some MapReduce optimizations. We invented an idea called multi-shard combiners, which really helped us here. And this allowed us to share the model statistics efficiently across the multiple cores. And so we got the, uh, the obvious benefit. And that is that we can share this very large amount of memory that we use across multiple cores. The first core that runs on a machine consumes lots of memory. Every incremental core is essentially free when it comes to RAM. And so just to reflect on the last two slides, we'd made a big bet on Moore's Law, and um, it really worked out for us in the past. And I'm hoping that it will continue to pan out, at least for the immediate future. OK, so uh, with this, I'm done with the design principles in Sybil. I want to talk about some of the performance uh, numbers that we saw when we were running Sybil. So I'm going to talk about some data which is about two years old, but things have not materially changed since then, so this is still completely relevant today. I'm going to talk about data from four different products. It doesn't really matter what they are, so I'm going to call them products A, B, C, and D. Um, this slide talks about the training data from these products. Um, I'm going to talk about the learner separately in the next slide. So as you can see, product A had about 60 billion training examples. Product C and D had well over 100 billion training examples. The next column, which talks about compressed raw data, is um, the amount of space that we needed to store those training data. We encoded the data in uh, Google's protocol message format, which is a pretty efficient format to store data. It's certainly more efficient than XML, for example. Um, but it was not optimized for our particular case. We also ran pretty heavy compression because it's a lot of data. And these are the numbers that we got. So product A needed about 10 terabytes. Product C and D needed well over 50 terabytes to store their, store their training data. Now, when we converted that data into our own internal format, which is the column format that I mentioned with this um, integer encoding, the data compressed pretty substantially from there. So as you can see, the training data for product A went from about 10 terabytes to 2 terabytes. That's a, like a 5x compression. It's pretty dramatic. B, C, and D didn't really do that well, but they're still pretty good. They're in the three to four range. The next column talks about the number of features, for example, in our training data. And as you can see, product A has about 55 features per training example. B, C, and D have closer to 100 features per training example. 
The last column shows you the effect of all the compression that we used. In product A, we used less than one byte per feature. Products B, C, and D used about one byte per feature. I want to put this in context. Remember that these features, when they come to us the first time, they are strings. They could be 10 to 100 bytes long. So um, that's pretty, pretty uh, sparse, right? We're able to bring that down to about one byte. Now, if you convert these into an integer, if you have 100 billion values, you're going to need five bytes, right? So just converting it to an integer gets you down to about five bytes. The rest of this value you're seeing comes from our variable length encoding, the fact that feature number zero is the most compact feature, is the most frequent feature, and the fact that we ran compression over all of this. So we're able to get down from, you know, many tens of bytes per feature to less than, a, to about one byte per feature with all this compression. And again, because we're working at scale, this is super important to us. <clears throat> this next slide gives you some numbers from a learner. And again, I'm going to use products A, B, and C. And I picked one learner from each of these. So as you can see, we have the same number of training examples as you would expect. For those of you paying attention, you'll notice that the number of features per example has actually come down. And this reflects uh, a theme that I mentioned before. That is that a pipeline typically has a lot more features, um, features that are both important and some of which are experimental. When our users actually run learners, they don't use all those features. And so the number of features, for example, in a learner is typically less than what you have in a pipeline. Product A's learner was using 195 cores. Product C and D were using closer to 1,000 cores. The iteration time of these learners varied from about 10 minutes to about an hour and a half. And then finally, I want to draw your attention to the last column, which is the, uh, the speed at which these learners run. And as you can see, A was doing about 3.3 million features per second per core. B, C, and D were using were a little slower, but in the same ballpark. So again, it's good to see what the baseline here is. Um, remember that we're going to be doing random accesses into a very, very large vector. We have billions of features, and every feature is some, somewhat randomly distributed over um, in memory. What is more, two consecutive examples probably don't have, whole, uh, don't have too many features in, co uh, in common. So, in some sense, this computation is going to be dominated by our ability to look up data in RAM. And we're going to take a cache miss most of the time, because these features are randomly distributed over RAM. Now, when I was taking these numbers, the cost of a cache miss was probably 50 to 100 nanoseconds. In many cases, we were also taking page table misses, by the way. So we take a second cache miss as well. Um, so if you, if you assume that the cost of a cache miss is 50 to 100 nanoseconds, our baseline is 10 to 20 million features per second per core. And what you've seen here is a system that is, while it's not there, it's in the rough ballpark. So we still have some upside here, probably maybe even a 10x upside. We don't have like a 200x upside from here. Um, and by the way, these are end-to-end -end numbers. It's not just cash misses. It's the cost of the whole map reduce, the shuffle phase, the stuff that you do in the reducer, etc. as well. <clears throat> so this final slide about performance talks about concurrency. Remember how I said that we'd optimize for multi-core? So um, I ran this synthetic experiment where I took one of our learners and I ran it in different settings. <clears throat> I ran it with 4 cores and 10 machines for a total of 40 cores. I also ran it with 8 cores and 10 machines, 12 cores and 10 machines, and 16 cores and 10 machines. <clears throat> and as you can see, the speed of the learner improves almost linearly with the number of cores. So this kind of validates that we did, uh, made some good design decisions for multi-core. We can actually use up to 16 cores pretty effectively, uh, at least in this benchmark. Okay, so with that, I want to start um, summarizing my talk. I'm done with my performance numbers. Um, from a software engineering point of view, I noticed that our focus changed over time. When we started Sybil, we were all excited about algorithms, and uh, we spent all our effort building the algorithms. But then as we went along, we realized that our users didn't really care about the algorithms so much. That was stuff that worked, and so they didn't think about it. What they were much more concerned about was how to integrate their particular product with our system. The core of the system was the same for all of them, so they didn't need to think about it. 
but they wanted they spent all spent all their time looking at how their systems connected to us that's what they had to customize so our attention started moving to how we integrate with other systems but then when i look at my long term users they don't even think about this because they've gotten it to work what they really care about is analysis and tools they want to know what's you know breaking in their pipeline and they want to get ideas for new signals that they can use to produce better models so it's interesting to see that the focus of this project evolved over time um and in fact the focus of my, my own focus changed when i was doing um, distributed computing algorithms in the past as well the first time i built a consensus algorithm for a production setting i focused on algorithms the second time i realized even before i started the project that my focus would not be algorithms it would be testing um as i mentioned in my um paper on paxos made live uh, several years ago now if i were to do it again i know that my focus would be different again so it's an interesting analogy here um i want to talk about some other approaches to large scale machine learning um i described to you a batch learner in a batch learner it's iterative and in each iteration we take an approximate solution the entire data set and we produce a better approximate solution in fact there are the other approaches that have been studied in the literature um stochastic approaches are reasonably popular as well and there's a rich body of literature there what we do in a stochastic approach is this we take an approximate solution we take a random subset of the examples it could be a tiny subset in fact it could be a single example even and then we produce a better model uh, and there's a rich body of literature that shows that you can actually do this and get pretty high quality models out of it now stochastic approaches tend to use custom runtimes in fact all the stochastic approach designs and implementations i've seen have built their own custom runtime uh, they can't use mapreduce and um, all of them have built distributed parameter servers so instead of having models in memory models sit out in a distributed hash table like data structure <clears throat> the second thing i want to point out because i think this is particularly relevant to this community is that there've been some recent developments in what i would call hogwild style algorithms and in fact i think hogwild is a technical term uh, you might even see occurrences of it in the literature people have found that they can run large machine learning algorithms with loose consistency requirements so people use shared memory machines without locks and they have multiple threads doing concurrent updates without locks and they've shown that those algorithms actually produce pretty good results they also use delayed updates so when they do an update to a parameter server the update doesn't happen immediately in fact if a machine does an update and then immediately after that does a read it can get the old value and in those settings people have gotten high quality machine learning results So the implication of this to this particular community is again that we've spent a lot of effort building strong consistency uh, primitives highly reliable systems here's another class of users that doesn't really need them they need weaker consistency primitives and so um, i think there's going to be some value in having a discussion between the two communities <clears throat> i want to end my talk with a wish list this is not a comprehensive wish list but these are the kinds of things that the machine learning layer is going to impose i think on um lower layers of the stack so as you've seen uh we could really have benefited from a flexible efficient columnar store i'd rather not have built my own now did the database community has built these but these tend to be monolithic what we'd rather like is something that's more flexible um uh, and something that can meet our needs in particular i'd like to have the ability to do a dictionary based compression um uh, in my column store civil is almost completely built in c++ it would have been really nice to have single machine um uh, machine learning kernels like blast for the numerical uh, community now these primitives must be able to deal with very large data sets you can't assume that you have all your data in memory rather we're going to stream data through the machine and we're going to throw it away after we're done with it it would be good to have other higher level primitives as well a distributed computing primitives much like what mpi does for the numerical community uh and if it had the right primitive it would have raised our level of abstraction made civil a whole lot easier than it is i also think that the distributed computing primitive should explicitly support stochastic learners and perhaps we should think about how we're going to add a parameter server to uh, our distributed computing primitives
And finally, we have written Moore's Law and we've really benefited from it and we hope to continue to write it. But I want to highlight a few places where we are particularly interested. So remember that Sybil depended on very, very large memory machines. So I'm very interested in knowing where memory systems are headed. I want more, I want bigger, right? Now, this doesn't just have implications to the hardware community. This also has implications, for example, to the JVM community. So JVM builders should think about how they're going to make their heap take the entire space on, uh, on the machine. I've seen situations where you have machines with like 64 gigs of RAM, but the JVM only uses 10 gigs of RAM in, in, its, uh, in its heap, and that wouldn't work for us. If I have a machine with 64 gigs of RAM, I want my heap to have 64 gigs of it. We're also very interested in data set size. So um, our data sets continue to grow. We tackle bigger and bigger problems, more and more features. Um, so we're very interested in network bandwidth and where the networking community is going to take bandwidth. Um, we're going to put more and more data through these systems and we want to process them quickly. Uh, Sybil is much less interested in latency. Our, our computation doesn't really care about latency. If it takes me a, set, a second to set up a connection, that's totally fine with me. However, the stochastic community does care about latency. So for them, they would also want a low latency network. Um, so yeah, we're going to look for these requirements um, and how they're going to be met by um, Moore's Law evolving in the future. Okay, so with that, I'm done uh, with my talk, and I'll be happy to take some questions.